Okay, so I'm actually yeah, I'm actually doing a talk, and it's going to be about progressive web apps. Uh, I'm going to give it a slightly different kind of angle because I've I think that's the whole point. Otherwise, we're just kind of rehashing uh, other talks that you might have seen. Um, so I've kind of got a different a different spin on it, and and hopefully that kind of resonates with uh, with some of you. But before we we kind of kick off, <coughs> I think it's it's really important to kind of understand where where we are and how lucky we are in terms of our our connection speed. And we've heard, you know, Kenneth mentioned, you know, costs of downloading parts of the macro site and and discussion with with Len about, you know, how this is going to save us uh, potentially save us download speed. Um, this is a picture of uh, from National Geographic of a, a bunch of people on a beach in Djibouti trying to connect to a cell tower in um, um, Somalia, which is kind of mind-blowing that the connection would be so bad that you'd actually have to kind of walk to a certain spot in order to try and kind of connect to a tower in a neighboring country. Um, and I think it, it kind of just tells us how, how lucky we actually are. It's not something that, that we can necessarily, um, you know, kind of take for granted. And I think it's too easy to take for granted. Uh, I think a lot of us probably have fiber at home and we kind of stream a whole bunch of stuff, and we've got a whole bunch of uh, devices, but it's not, that's kind of not really the real world, and that's often not the, the world that our users live in. Um, so, I mean, just as a quick show of hands, who's got fiber at home? Okay, so... <laughs> I w Thankfully, there wasn't a mic in the front for that comment. Um, and just kind of on that note, who, and this is a bit of an aside, but who works remotely? for a chunk of the time. Okay, so it's still a small percentage. So, I mean, that's not, that's not the real world. I mean, the real world, I think, is, you know, driving 45 minutes into work and working in a place you don't like, and we kind of get the ability to actually create really cool things and be creative, even if we're not actually artists and not actually engineers. Um, <laughs> but we still kind of, we still kind of have artistic angles and we kind of engineer stuff, um, even though engineer is actually a completely different thing. Um, how's that for throwing the cat amongst the pigeons? Um, in terms of kind of where our users are, I think they're somewhere between this kind of perfect world that a lot of us live in, in terms of connection speed, and, and these guys on the beach in Djibouti. Uh, and I think it's kind of somewhere in that spectrum in between. And often we don't really take that for granted, and I certainly don't. Uh, or at least I don't, I don't kind of put myself in the user's shoes and say, what would it be like to sit in the back of a conference venue trying to tweet out things on a 3G connection that gives me one out of five bar, which has kind of been the whole day today. Um, and I'm not saying that that's like a whole huge amount of suffering or anything, but it just kind of puts things in perspective about how applications behave. Uh, and even some of the really popular apps that I'm not going to mention because we're recording this, um, and how those actually behave. And it's, it's something that we often don't really see. So what is the problem? So the problem is not just a kind of a on the internet versus not on the internet, but there's a huge spectrum in between where people are connected, but they're connected at such a, a bad connection speed that they're not experiencing the web as we experience it. Um, and that's a huge chunk of the market. And even if you're not necessarily targeting that market, the fact that you've got a, a website running means that you potentially are having users that are experiencing your, your site, your service, in a really bad way. Um, and, you know, Facebook and other companies have, have seen that, um, which is why they're bringing out things like Facebook Zero, which means that you can use Facebook for free, um, you know, based on certain plans. Uh, and I think one of the reasons they're doing that is they want to try and go after that last chunk, which is a huge chunk because it's a couple of billion people, but that chunk of people that aren't necessarily online yet, and they want to facilitate that. Um, so it's great that it's free, but obviously there's a, you know, there's a kind of knock-on effect that those people would then start making purchases and start you know, doing other things within the Facebook ecosystem, uh, which is cool. Um, so the other thing, let's just go back one. Um, the other thing in terms of some of the metrics so this is from a, a study that DoubleClick did, which is, which is part of Google. They said that 53% of 
visits to the site, if it takes more than three, three seconds, uh, they actually bounce. So l users lose interest within a couple of seconds of trying to hit your site if they you know, see things are not kind of responsive enough. Um, and that by, it might be more forgiving in a market that isn't as internet savvy, uh, but I certainly think that's a good target to go for. Actually saying, if the site doesn't render within a couple of seconds, presume that there's zero value and there's zero usage and there's kind of zero uh, user adoption. But sometimes I kind of think that we're, we're using computer science in, a, in the wrong way. I think maybe sometimes we're going after the wrong kind of problems. Um, and I had to kind of read this a couple of times. I thought it was that 1K challenge, the JavaScript thing that I didn't enter because my JavaScript isn't very good, uh, or at least not, not that good. Um, but I think that often we, we kind of over-engineer things, which I think is such a pity because they're such fundamental problems that we haven't solved. So here's an example. Who's signed their name as a form of authentication in the last month or two? So think of how, how stupid that is. <laughs> You're actually, you kind of just make a little squiggle on the page, and, and that's cool. Uh, it's such an archaic, archaic format of, of trying to authenticate yourself. And we've got all these other ways that we can do it. We can do it with you know, biometric and retina scanning and all this kind of thing except there's a whole market out there that just hasn't kind of said, well, maybe asking a user to you know, scribble on a, on a piece of paper is, is not the best way to, talk, to authenticate them. Um, and it's kind of strange that so many big institutions just haven't kind of, kind of hooked into that yet. Every time I sign for my business account, I always get kind of flagged in the bank, and they bring out an old, like, looks like an old kind of fax of a, of a signature I probably did when I was 20. Uh, and they said, no, you're not, you're not this guy. Um, and I can't really argue with them because it just, it's, so the, what they tend to do is then turn the, the monitor so I can see it and then I kind of half trace it and they said, that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, that's, that's the degree. So they can say, well, cool, then you've signed it and then everything's fine. So yeah, that, um, that's not me kind of making up a story. That's, that's actually what happens. Um, so what's the issue with the other end? What's the issue with, with apps? So I'm sure we've all got um, you know, pretty high-powered devices, and that's, that's absolutely cool. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing bad about that. But if you look at the, the average, I took a screenshot uh, on the right-hand side of a couple of apps a month ago. Um, and the average, just for those first five, is 68 megs. And those are apps that I've already downloaded and potentially have downloaded a whole bunch of updates for. And the updates for that day was another, on average, 68 megs, which is crazy. And if you imagine if you're on a, a low connection speed or you're paying a lot, like a big premium for that, what the amount of money is. It's just, it's obscene. You just wouldn't do it. Um, and the other issue is every kind of step you make the user go to in order to actually get into your app, you're losing 20%, uh, which is just a study that they've done. So you kind of lose the whole ability to do any kind of deep linking because you can't really deep link into an app that the user doesn't have if you have to kind of go via the app store. I don't think that works. Um, I think you kind of lose that connection. If they've got the app, you can deep link into it, but you can't really do it, I don't think, if you're going via the store. So what has that all got to do with um, this idea of PWAs. So who's heard of PWAs? Who's an expert in PWAs? <laughs> um, I need to talk to them. Uh, so the progressive web apps are not, a, are not a new thing. This is something that's been around for a long time. Um, who remembers things like, like DHTML? Yeah? Who remembers things like um, HTML5? And and object orientation. So we all remember those things. So my feeling about what progressive web apps is about, and we're going to get into what that means, is it's kind of what those terms used to be, because we don't really refer to HTML5 anymore. I don't really see us sitting down and I'm writing HTML5 or I'm writing object orientation. It's kind of just techniques that kind of seep into what you do every day. And for me, that's exactly what post, uh, progressive web apps are going to be. I think what's happened is I think a lot of tech journalists have kind of jumped on the, on the bandwagon and have kind of made it into this new technology or this, um, this new kind of hybrid app system 
and it's going to blow out all the, the native apps, and no one ever is, is going to write native apps anymore. And to me, it's just a collection of best practices, which I really think is what it's about. So let's have a look at what these best practices are. First of all, there's this idea of a service worker, which we're going to get into what that is. Um, caching is pretty much what you would presume it is, and that's the ability to cache files within the browser, um, which is pretty useful. So it's not like a cookie where you cache kind of name value pairs. You can actually cache, easily cache you know, whole files, which is useful. Uh, it's, going the, it's going the route of offline capabilities. So how many of the systems that you've written are actually functional to some extent if the user pulls out the network cable? So mine aren't, um, just in case you thought I was going to say, well, all of mine are. Um, but that will be really useful. Imagine the user being able to, even if they're disconnected, to see something, to see maybe the, the Chrome of your website and some kind of message saying, well, you're not connected, so you can't do this, this, and this, um, or maybe hear the last messages or, or something to that effect, at least making it minimally useful. It doesn't have to be completely, you know, you can't navigate the whole thing, but maybe minimally useful at least. The next is this idea of a web app manifest, which we're going to get into. Um, but what that really is, is just a, a JSON file that replaces a lot of those meta tags that we used to use. Um, so I'll show you an example of that. IndexedDB is something that uh, I think Len mentioned, uh, which is basically like a, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a proper storage engine within the browser. And there are a lot of wrapping libraries to make it more useful, uh, but it's like a built-in database, which is, which is pretty cool, the fact that it actually is part of your browser. HTTPS. Is, is obviously something that's been around a while. Um, who's ensured that all of their sites are HTTPS? Okay. Who knows that they should have done that? <laughs> so, and the next one is add to home screen. You can see they made up a new acronym. It's not a three-letter acronym, but so it's a new acronym. Actually, no, it is a three-letter acronym because the one of them is a digit, I guess. Um, But I think what's happening here is I think it's, it's, we're kind of getting to a point where, again, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, hopefully a lot of it's not new to you. So it's stuff that's just kind of out there. And a progressive web app really is a, is a website that's been done in accordance with, with newer best practices. That's really what it is. It's not a, a new framework. I mean, thank goodness. We don't need to have any new frameworks this week. Um, and it's not a you know, a new vendor trying to do something, and it's, you know, it's nothing like that. It's really just a, a new set of best practices that we can follow. So how do we know if we've actually got an issue? Because there's no point going back to work on Monday, and I know you're all going to refactor all the JavaScripts anyway, um, <laughs> but there's no point kind of deleting everything and then making everything a, a PWA, because we can't call it progressive web app. We have to use the, the TLA instead. Um, so how do we know if we've got some kind of networking or some kind of performance issue? So obviously the best way to do it, which is the most difficult from a, uh, like to actually do it, is to simulate what the user's environment is. Um, how many of you, and myself included, have actually gone into Chrome and actually modified the CPU and modified the, the networking to actually simulate some kind of user? OK, so some. Now I feel bad. Um, so let's take a look at, at some of the things that we can do. So Chrome seems to be the, the de facto standard for web developers. And I think the reason that it is like that is the fact that it has, is the tooling is so good. So built into Chrome, for those that aren't aware, is um, the performance tab, which used to be the timeline tab. They've kind of shifted it around, which makes doing demos later tight a bit awkward. Uh, and this gives you a complete you know, diagram of everything that's running on the network, everything is affecting performance, and it allows you to actually drill down and find out exactly where the performance issues are. And I think it's really important to do that because you're not just guessing, and you're not just kind of making a change and then hoping for the best. You can actually see in detail where the performance bottlenecks are. So the next thing that you can do is you can run, there's a metric, uh, there's a, um, a node module called PW Metrics. So PW for progressive web, I guess. Um, and you just install it globally, and you can run it. And what it does is it fires up Chrome, and it runs through a bunch of tests, and it outputs these metrics at the bottom. So this was on like 2.5G outside. So the 
The website is not, doesn't take 12 seconds, I don't think, to render. But a couple of things that are really important that come out of that. The one is this idea of time to interactive. So how many seconds or how many milliseconds does it take for your site to be, uh, for, or for the user to be able to actually interact with your site? And for me, there's nothing worse than having half the site render and you try and click on something, but by the time the site's registered that you've clicked on it, there's a, a video or there's an image or something and things are kind of moving around and it's really painful to try and use. So that's time to interactive. Time to first paint I don't think is as useful because that's kind of the first time you see something on screen. The last metric that, that is more useful to me, I think, is time to meaningful content. So how long does it take until you see something meaningful on screen? And if it takes more than a couple of seconds, the user's going to lose interest and potentially you're going to lose them, uh, which is obviously going to be an issue. So the next tool to work out if there is an issue is something called Lighthouse. Does anyone use Lighthouse? Okay, so it's a, it's a free tool. You can install it. You can either run it separately or you can run it as a, as a node, as a Chrome installation or Chrome extension. And all you need to do if you run the site is click on the extension, click on generate report, and now don't judge me <laughs> when I show you the results. Because um, I really subtly put in the sold out in the screen clip before I put the results. Um, so this gives you, thank you for the, for the subtle whistle, I did hear that. <laughs> so this gives you a, a breakdown of a whole bunch of things that, are, that, that Lighthouse and Google feel that aren't right with your site. And a lot of them are based on this newer way of thinking, this newer progressive web application way of thinking, uh, which there is a checklist. So things like service workers become a requirement, and we're going to have a look now at what service workers are. Being able to have some kind of response when the site is offline, which is what I mentioned earlier, that becomes a prerequisite. Using HTTPS is important. Um, and obviously, time, you know, time to load is also really important. So Lighthouse gives you a very quick way of actually looking at where your metrics are, and it gives you a good amount of detail about where you need to put the effort. Uh, and I think that's really important. So the next one is, and this was from a, um, an article and subsequent talks that Jake Archibald has done. For those that aren't familiar with Jake Archibald, go and have a look at his uh, YouTube videos. They're really good. So this explains where service workers kind of fit in. And service workers are a weird thing. And it took me a while to kind of figure out what, what it is. So it's a JavaScript file, which is simple enough. I'm sure we've all created those. But it's actually, it's almost kind of a meta thing on your website. So it's not something that's necessarily going to run kind of inline like all the other JavaScript. It's almost like as your website loads for the first time, it can offer up its service worker to the browser. And that service worker effectively is, is almost taken out of the website and kind of stored within the browser itself, which seems really weird. So kind of what's the point in doing that? So the point of doing that is it means that, amongst a couple of other things that you can do, if your website is no longer available, that service worker can actually respond to requests, which is really cool. So it actually becomes like a, like a proxy. It sits between your actual website and, and the, the networking point. So every request that you do can actually go via a certain call in the, in the service worker. So that kind of sounds really weird. But for me, the, the big benefit is the fact, again, that you can cache a bunch of files. And then when those requests come in, instead of going out to the, to the actual server, you can just say, well, I've got them in cache, so here's the immediate result. Which means if your entire site is offline, you can potentially return some kind of meaningful content. It could potentially be the entire site. If you've got something like, um, I think, like the Chrome, the Chrome status page, is a, is a PWA, and it uses a service worker to cache a lot of the data. Uh, but obviously, for a business system or a banking system, you can't do that kind of thing. But it doesn't mean that you can't offer up some information. So if the user's offline, you can then show them something. And you can also structure the calls in a certain way that if the user is online, you could show them the cached version immediately. And then as soon as the new data comes in, you can actually use that to refresh the page, uh, which is really useful. And that's not something that you can necessarily do with, with cookies, because there has to be an actual page that's going to run to actually call into the cookie and actually do things. With a service worker, you can actually have that separate component running in the browser itself. Um, 
So that sounds really cool. Uh, obviously, there's a small downside, is that it doesn't necessarily work in all browsers, um, which is a big issue. So this is a cool website, uh, which again is part of what Jake Archibald has done. It's called Is Service Worker Ready? And the general answer is yes for Chrome and yes for Firefox, um, but no specifically for iOS, um, which is an issue. Because if you're targeting a whole broad spectrum of users, those users are not going to get the benefit. But specifically, you don't have to make, you make your entire website work around a service worker. It can be an opt-in thing. So it means if, if it's enabled in the browser, you can use it, and you can get that offline experience, and you can get that immediate feedback because you can pull back cached data. But if it's not enabled or if it's not uh, supported, then we can just use very, very simple feature detection and then just not return that, which I'm going to show you now. So just on the iOS thing, this is not an iOS versus Android thing, um, but it is a comparison between the two ecosystems. The, the one benefit I think that iOS has is if they change their mind, and there's indication looking at um, you know, what, the, what some parts of the WebKit team have been talking about, that it might happen, albeit in, in like a five-year window. But if if iOS changes their mind, they can flick it on. And suddenly, you know, a huge chunk of the market gets that, that update, even if they only do it for the latest version. Uh, this is um, kind of eight months ago or nine months ago, so it is a little bit off just in terms of the version split. So imagine if, if iOS 11 comes out and they say, we've changed our mind and we've switched it on, because there's no, I don't think there's any technical reason why they can't do it. Then within a couple of months, that entire problem has gone away. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind. But it also means that you don't have to wait to use it because you can do feature detection. So let's take a look at what a service worker looks like. So this would be a normal web page. And within that web page, where you would normally call out to a script, you know, just using the normal script tag and just call out to a certain script that would be running, what we can do, we can do feature detection. And on the window, we can, do a, we can hook into the load event and we can then register a service worker. <coughs> and this registering of the service worker is kind of saying, here's this service worker file. Go and kind of almost take it out of my website, put it in the browser itself, so it's disconnected. Which means, again, if your website is down, it doesn't mean the whole thing falls over, because they can actually go via that service worker. So it's kind of a, it is a weird concept. Um, I'm hopefully not the only one who, who knew about that thing you can do in console log where you can actually style the content. Uh, so you can then do cool things like that. Um, am I the only one that didn't know about that? Um, hopefully it's a new thing. Yes, I'm the only one that didn't know about that. Thank you, Rob. Um, so that's what we've done here. So within our normal, let's say our index.html page, we can have this bit of feature detection. And within that, we can then load, we can kind of offer up our service worker to the browser. Uh, this just gives an indication of, of how cool that console logging is, um, which I would, I would recommend doing throughout. So the next thing is to being able to, so once we've, so in order to actually take certain files and say to, our, say to the browser, here are the files that I want you to cache. So as a service worker loads these are the, and installs, which is that event, I want you to go and pre-populate the cache with these files. So it's really, there's a whole bunch of different patterns you can use, but this is about as simple as it gets. You give your cache a name, you give it an array of files. These could be you know, images and JavaScript files and whatever else you want. And it then will wait to populate the cache. So if any of that fails, it's in kind of a transaction. Um, it, the whole thing's going to fail. So you can actually say, here's the thing that I want you to do on installation. Go and install all of these things into the cache. And where that ends up is within the application tab in Chrome, you can see your service worker. On the left-hand side, you can choose, obviously, between manifests and whatever else and service workers. Uh, there's also some tools that assist you as a developer. So you can unregister a, a service worker because there's some uh, kind of complexity around no longer needing a service worker or you're updating a service worker. There's just a little bit of kind of workflow to understand around that. Uh, and in the bottom left-hand corner as well, you can now see where your cache is. So you can see exactly what is in cache, uh, which is really useful. 
And these, again, are files that would be stored. So how does offline work? So it could be as simple as this. Within our service worker, we hook you into the fetch event for the service worker, and we're saying whenever that fetch event fires, so whenever there's some kind of network activity, then respond with whatever's in the cache. So it's actually a very simple pattern. This is not going to be production ready because you've got to handle the fact that it maybe isn't in the cache or you no longer want it in the cache. So there's a bit of complexity around that. But you could potentially use this to get a very simple offline experience with your, with your site. So the next is a web app manifest. So who remembers doing Windows 7 pinned sites? where you could have a bunch of meta tags, and then if the user knew, which they wouldn't, to drag it into the uh, taskbar, <laughs> then it would, it would kind of install it, because it will have its own little custom icon and custom, um, what do you call it, colors and whatnot. And if they clicked on that, uh, which again, they probably wouldn't, but then it will open up IE 9 or 8, whatever it was at that point, and the whole browser would be kind of themed uh, based on that, on those meta tags, which is quite cool. So you kind of get the same experience now with this web app, web app manifest. So at the top is just an example of how you would hook that in. You don't need all these meta tags anymore. And then you can have a whole bunch of different icons and a whole bunch of the different kind of fields in that, in that JSON. I'm not going to get into that. Um, and some of the things that it gives you are things like uh, orientation. So you can support a certain orientation on the device. Again, if the device supports it, like Android. Um, you can support you know, theming colors, and you can support um, like an add to home page or add, add to home screen, uh, the, the type of icon, and what happens when they click it, and some of the behavior around that, and whether or not you show the, the address bar. So if you choose not to show the address bar, then it kind of looks like a sort of like a native app in a way. Um, and that's really the whole point. So the first prize is that we design for an environment where you can have some offline experience. And in order to do that, you've got to then have a service worker, and you've got to work around some of the limitations with that. Um, but honestly, the, the, um, the new things that they've introduced are actually not that complex. Uh, and service worker is really one of the main ones that, that allows you to do a whole bunch of things. So it's not just allowing immediate cached response, and it's not just allowing you to have some kind of offline experience. It also enables you to do things like uh, background syncing, which is really useful. So you could be completely offline, and you can save, save your tweet or save whatever you want, and you can have some way of handling that. So you can actually have background syncing, which is cool. And you can also do some degree of push notifications. Again, it's not going to work in all browsers, but you could enable that for some of your users, which I think is really useful. So something else that you're going to hear a whole lot of uh, when you start kind of doing a bit more research in, in what's been happening the last few, maybe the last year or so, is this idea of the purple pattern. Who's heard of the purple pattern? OK, so that's cool. I mean, it doesn't really matter um, if you've heard about it or not. So it stands, it's actually a very simple concept. The one is, the P is push the initial content. The next is render that initial content. The next is pre-cache all the bits that you're going to need. And the next is do some kind of uh, lazy loading. So these really are, are basic concepts that we can apply to anything. And I think using those four items, you can apply that to, to native app development or you know, you know, Windows Forms development, whatever you're doing. It's, uh, it doesn't rely on whether or not it's a website or whether or not you've got service workers or whether or not you're supporting certain browsers. These are things I think that we can all do. So you're going to push down the initial bits. You're going to render those initial bits. You're then going to pre-cache what you can kind of ahead of time. And then you're going to do lazy loading on, on the remainder. Um, so it's actually really simple. And they often talk about this idea of the app shell model. And all the app shell model is is defining some kind of uh, skeleton for your application. So you often hear the word kind of Chrome, which kind of implies the actual kind of meat of your application, the kind of the, like the master page for those that did um, ASP.NET kind of way back. Uh, so it's kind of the, the skeleton of the application. So you need to define that in order to kind of load really quickly, and then you can put in the content. But I think often what happens, I mean, the, the alternative, if you want to like optimize everything, is just to remove all the semicolons. Um, and you can save yourself like megs of data. So 
Well, maybe not makes, but I'm sure you'd save yourself something. Uh, but don't do that. Um, but I think there's also something that often, you know, with, with all this new technology, we often don't take into account. And I spoke about it in the beginning, about taking, kind of being empathetic with your users and understanding what they're, gonna, what they're going through. And the only way you're going to do that is to actually kind of use the systems that they're using. And I think that often results in product teams making much better quality software because they typically use the product as opposed to maybe solution-oriented where you often don't get to use the system that you've made. You kind of make it and ship it and then you never use it. And it's because you never use it that you never get to kind of iron out you know, oh, this page took five minutes to load, but you know, from a technical angle, it's, it's perfect, uh, and all the unit tests pass. So one of the things that we're doing with one of our teams, and this is, um, obviously I can't show you the exact thing, but this is the essence of it, is to ask the users for some kind of feedback about how happy the system makes them. Because there's no point focusing on, on unit testing and, and a whole bunch of other kind of high-tech things if we're not actually having some kind of empathy with our users. So I think that's really important, to actually work out if we ship a new version of the software, is it making the users more happy or less happy? Um, so what I'm hoping we're going to end up with is I'm hoping we're going to start moving away from overusing the term PWAs and progressive web apps. Not because I don't think it's a great idea. I think the underlying tech is, is fantastic but I think it's, it's kind of getting overused and people are kind of making it out to be this brand new thing and this brand new framework and this brand new whatever. To me, it just comes down to a couple of practices. And my version of PWA is focusing on performance, whatever that means. And if it means you don't use service workers, but you've gone from a 10 meg page down to a one meg page, I mean, you've done more than most people. So that's not a bad thing. You don't have to feel compelled to use all the new bits. The next is kind of watching conference videos and keeping up to date. Uh, and I know that's a bit self-serving because we will release our conference videos in a month. But there's so much content out there, and I think looking at things like the Chrome, uh, the Google I.O., um, or the WWDC videos, or whatever your interest lies, there's so much content out there. And the last is acting like a user. So to actually put yourself in their shoes and use the systems and use it the way they use it and actually experience it and actually see what what the result is. Um, and to me, that last point is probably more important than pushing service workers down everyone's throat. Um, and that's certainly something that I'm guilty of not doing. Um, okay, cool. So we'll obviously distribute all the slides. Um, and there's a whole bunch of content out there. The first one, which is again part of what Jake Archibald has done, is, is fantastic. So read through that. I'm not knocking PWAs. I'm just saying that it represents a whole bunch of tech that's been around a while. And I think we can pull out the bits of tech that work for us. And I don't know if looking at a, a sanitized checklist is necessarily the best way to do it, because maybe certain things just aren't applicable. Um, OK, cool. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
um, 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 but yeah, thank you again to all the to all the speakers. Uh, the content has been fantastic. We will release all the videos and all the, the slides and whatever else. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors, and thank you, obviously, to, to all of you for being here. Um, that was really cool. So let's do some, some prizes. Let's do, let me do this one first. Yeah. Um, Rochelle, do you want to come up? Oh, do you send him? Um, so this is from In Reality, who's in the corner. This is a um, Samsung Home Automation Smart Things Start Kit, which looks.